You might have seen my previous video on Semantic Link, which allows us to access Power BI datasets using Python within Microsoft Fabric. Well, in this video, I'm gonna give you something very special. I'm bringing you a new series called Feature 360, in which I'm gonna be going through how I learn new features, and I'm gonna be implementing it for Semantic Link. I'm gonna be showing you how I think about learning new technology, and I'm going to be applying it specifically to Semantic Link, which is the new feature in Microsoft Fabric. We're going to be going through the user stories. We're going to be looking at every single element of Semantic Link. We're going to be looking at strategies and recipes that you can apply for specific use cases. Then towards the end of the video, we're going to be looking at warnings, things you need to bear in mind before you go out and implement this stuff, this feature in your organization. Then I'm going to give you some closing thoughts or uh, some kind of conclusions, summary of what I think about Semantic Link and how you can kind of go forward in your Semantic Link journey. Okay, so I've organized a bit of a 360 degree board here around Semantic Link. So Semantic Link is our feature that we're going to be looking at in more detail today. And what I've done is I've divided up the page into five sections. So we've got starting at the top right, user stories, then everything, strategies and recipes, warnings, and then final thoughts. So these are the things that we're going to be covering in this lesson today. Now, the structure of this page loosely resembles how I like to learn new things, new anything really, but specifically new concepts or new libraries. And what I've done is I've just written down on the page or given a bit of structure to the page, how I best learn. So I think what's really important in Microsoft Fabric is, or in anything really, is learning how to learn because obviously this space is moving so quickly and Semantic Link is today's hot new feature. But what's more important is understanding how you best learn for yourself so that you can learn these new things as quickly and efficiently as possible. So this is what I, or the method that I use to learn things. It might be different for you, but we'll see how we go. And I'll explain each of these in a bit more detail as we go around. Starting off, user stories. So if you're not familiar with the concept of user stories, it comes from product management, right? So generally it happens when we're designing a product, we create user stories to understand who the intended user is, what they want to do with your product and why they want to do that, right? Those are kind of the three core elements of a user story. And so when I'm learning a new technology, I like to think about user stories of what is or what was the user story that the product people kind of had in their minds, okay? And it gives you a bit of a formulation as to who these feature sets are for, what they can do with it, and why the product group th think that this is important, right? So what I've done here is I've given you three user stories. So Semantic Link is quite a broad set of features. You can actually do a lot of different things with it. So just three user stories is probably not enough. But what I've tried to do is distill the main ones. And from our interview last week with Marcus, he alluded to the three core users, those being the Power BI developer, the data scientist, and also like the, the analyst or business analyst who wants to dabble in a bit of Python. Mine are kind of in line with those, maybe a little bit different and, and really explain why. So the first user story that I've highlighted here, and I've used the structure as a blank, I want to blank, so that blank. So the first user story that I've identified is as a data scientist, I want to use Python to integrate Power BI data and relationships, so the Power BI semantic model so that I don't have to spend time recreating semantic logic in Pandas for EDA and modeling. So a lot of the team that built Semantic Link are data scientists. And I think you can tell a lot from who's building products as to what the intention of Microsoft is, right? Now that's not to say that the data scientist is the only, is the only user of Semantic Link, but it is, I think anyway, been built heavily for data scientists. So that's important that we note down. But it's not just data scientists. So the second user story that I've highlighted is more of a data engineer. 
And as a data engineer, I want to validate the data in Power BI datasets. So including those that uh, Power BI developers created. And why do I want to do that? Because I want to test or validate that the DAX measures that our Power BI developer has created is actually valid. You know, it's, it's giving us the right results. And this is something that's very, or previously was very difficult to do, especially in a kind of online environment. You can kind of do it once when you're creating your dashboard and you can test your measures with a few different um, kind of end-to-end -end scenarios, give it a few numbers, have a look at the result. But it's difficult to do this kind of on an ongoing basis because once a Power BI model has been developed, it's difficult to where it previously was without semantic link, it's very difficult to actually validate what's going on in that model, right? So semantic link allows us to do this and we'll look at these in a bit more detail in a minute. So the third one I've mentioned here is, as a Power BI developer, I want to have a mechanism to easily create documentation for my Power BI semantic models so that other colleagues can understand the logic that I've applied. So. Again, documentation of our Power BI models, I think it's a very important topic. It's challenging to do, it's quite work intensive, right? Because you have to sit there and document every single data set in your model and every single measure. And that is quite time consuming. So if I can save some time doing that uh, with Semantic Link, then that would be great. So these are the three user stories that I've identified off the bat. As I said, there's lots more, but these are kind of the three that for me, help me understand the logic that Microsoft have applied, uh, why they've built what they've built here. So that's the first section of user stories. And I think once we understand those, we have a better understanding of the core philosophy that Microsoft have kind of had in their minds when they were developing this product. So the next step in our kind of learning journey is for me anyway, I like to know everything that this new library can do. Uh, I don't need to understand it, but I need to at least be exposed to it, right? I need to know it exists because sometimes you learn maybe 10% of a library and then you kind of get a bit bored or you get distracted or you do something else. And then you come back to it and you find a completely new section of the API that actually would have helped you do your work uh, very well, like would have helped you achieve a particular task, but you didn't know about it up front, right? So I appreciate this might not be for everyone, but what I like to do is at least list out every single thing that the API or in the semantic link example, it's everything that we can do with Senpai basically in our notebooks. And so this is what I've done here and I've divided it into two sections. We've got the data frame API, I'm calling it, and the Spark based stuff. So obviously we can use semantic link with pandas like data frames, the fabric data frame, which we talked about in the previous video, but we can also directly query it using like a spark type, well, well using spark. Um, and we look at both of these. So, okay, let's just start here. So at the top here, what I've done is basically you just go through the documentation. I've listed out all of the different classes and functions that make up Firstly, senpai.fabric, which is like the core senpai library, right? And then I try to look for patterns or group things that are kind of near each other in terms of usefulness, right? So in the classes, let's just focus in on these ones. There's four main classes. We've got fabric series, which is uh, obviously a wrapper around pandas series as well. Fabric data frame, the same. And fabric data category and metadata keys, which are a bit less important, but the data category is Power BI data categories. Um, then what I've done is because data frame, the fabric data frame is the most important one of these, I've also gone into the specific methods that we can call on an object of type fabric data frame. So if we create a fabric data frame, calling it DF, we also get access to these methods. So add measure is a very important one. So add measure basically helps us add a new column and it calculates a specific measure on a data frame. So we've got a data frame, say of four columns. We can call add measure 
and it basically adds another column onto that. And I'll leave a link to the documentation. There's a very good documentation page that explains this specific phenomenon, this specific thing. So another method we have available to us for the fabric data frame is two lake house table. So that's something to bear in mind, that's important. And we also have these dependencies. So all of the dependency type stuff are methods of the fabric data frame class, okay? So this makes sense because we haven't talked much about dependencies, but what dependency is, is inconsistencies between columns in the same data frame, in the same table, right? So for example, a state code in the US, I'm gonna mess up here because I don't know any of the state codes, but you'd have two state codes that map to the same state, for example. So that would be an example of a dependency violation. So we can't do, obviously, all of the relationship stuff, which is more than one data frame, is not included as a method of the data frame object. But dependencies, because we can do it within one table, within one data frame, they are all methods of the fabric data frame class. So we can do find dependencies, we can do list dependency violations, plot dependency violations, and drop dependency violations. So those are the four methods available to us. So on the other side, we've got functions. So these are all obviously using import, import senpy.fabric as whatever you like there, as fabric. And then you can do fabric dot any of these things. So what I've done is I've grouped these into all of the list stuff. So you can list all of this stuff, data sets, tables, measures, relationships, relationship violations, all of the reads, which I think is only read table and read parquet. Then there's the evaluates. So you can evaluate raw DAX or you can evaluate a measure, right? And that's going to return a fabric data frame. And there's a few kind of helper functions here for getting information, kind of metadata about the lake house that you're in, the notebook that you're working in, the workspace ID, for example. And one that I missed out uh, kind of on first pass before I created this document, which is why it's a really good idea to read this document. And actually I was reading Sandeep Pawar's um, really good article on Semantic Link and its use cases. And he goes into, or he uses this function uh, in one of his use cases. So I think I mentioned this previously, but the Timsol tabular model scripting language that we can use to basically get even more information about different tables in our data set. So we can only get so much information using this kind of list data sets, list tables, these calls, only return about four or five columns with get TMSL or Timsol, then it's gonna allow us to bring back a lot more information. Um, and that we'll see in one of our use cases to come in a bit. So that's the core senpai.fabric library. Then we've got some kind of smaller ones. So we've got senpai.relationships. And in here you can obviously do from senpai.relationships import either star for all of these things, or you can get individual ones. And so this is where we're gonna be doing more specific work on relationships between two tables, right? And we can either ask Fabric to find them for us, or we can list the relationship violations, which means that two tables with a relationship between them say for example, a fact table and a dimension table. And in your fact table, a relationship violation would mean that not all of the data points in your fact table column that is also linked to the dimension table, not all of those data values exist in the dimension table. So say for example, you've got country ID in your fact table and you've got 200 unique values 
in that country ID fact table. But your dimension table has only got 150 unique keys. So then there'll be quite a lot of relationship violations because it's basically your dimension table is not complete or there's data quality issues in your fact table that you need to resolve. So it's basically a measure of data completeness, let's say. Find relationships, very interesting. Find relationships basically scans your um, two tables and looks for potential relationships based on not just by kind of the name of the column, which is a bit naive because you know, we know that that is not always consistent, but it's actually done by matching the number of unique values in each column, in each table, right? So that's quite a good way of doing that, I think. Um, and it works a lot better than, I think there was some previous thing functionality in Power BI to do that and it wasn't very good. But find relationships generally works quite well. So I'd, I'd recommend trying that out. Dependency, there is obviously its own library as well, as well as your kind of methods attached to the data frame. And what I've done is I've linked to a specific dependency tutorial on the Fabric documentation. So I'll, again, I'll leave this in a link to the description. Or if you want to download this Excalidraw file, then you can open it in Excalidraw and click on the links yourself. So functions is something quite interesting as well. So functions, if we scroll in here, functions allow us, us to write this kind of, these kind of decorators on top of a function that makes it a semantic function. So it's, it makes your function semantically aware. And the way that it does that is you pass in semantic parameters, okay? So you're gonna say, okay, in this example, we're defining a semantic function called is capital, and it's going to take as input your data frame, and you're going to tell it the, the country and the city. Yes, it's going to return a series of basically Boolean values if the city is a capital, right? And here it's kind of just hard coding this capitals, um, but you can also use some other things like the senpai or fabric to matcher. So. This is the concept, basically. It's using these decorator functions, and you can use them to basically create your own validation functions, I think, is the, the reasoning behind this. I'm not particularly won over that that is the best way of doing that, but you know, it's there for you to try out yourself and make your own decision on. Personally, I think it's better to kind of, I don't like libraries trying to be data validation libraries and creating your own data validation rule sets. I think there is a place for it, but there is also a massive eco ecosystem for data validation that we can tap into. Uh, and we will be going into that in a bit more detail later in the video. And there's also senpai.functions, right? Uh, dot samples. So you can download a sample data set, download Cynthia. Like for me anyway, just mapping out all of the possibilities or at least being exposed to it helps me understand the different parts of this library. And once you understand the different kind of ingredients, you can start to think, oh, I'm gonna connect this function with this function. I can do a one of these, then one of these. And you can start to think about kind of your use cases in your own organizations. And you can focus your time and learning on the things that are most important to you. But at least you have an appreciation for everything. So the other thing that I wanted to mention here was the Spark-based stuff. So it's not just kind of Pandas-type libraries, uh, like the, the Fabric data frame. We can also, if you're a Spark person, you can, first you have to do this setting up kind of Spark to point to the Power BI catalog, which is this line here that you need to put into your Spark data frame, uh, Spark notebook. And then we can access using this PBI dot data set name dot either a table name in your data set or this metrics, which is the um, kind of virtual table that Semantic Link exposes for us. And you can see how this works here. So here we're doing an average of the total revenue, which is one of our measures. And 
we're basically doing it in a group by statement by the country and the industry. And that is obviously going to return a Spark data frame. So if you're more of a Spark person and you want to do stuff in Spark using Spark functions, not using Pandas functions, then this is the method to go for you. And obviously, once you do your whatever you want to do in, in Spark, then you can use kind of df.write, the traditional Spark type functions for writing things into the lake house. So that is all of the different ingredients that we have to play with when we're looking at semantic link. Now, I might have missed off a few things here. And if I have, then let me know in the comments below. But I think I've covered most of the main things. OK, so now we get to the strategies, maybe the most important or most interesting thing. So we've had a look at all of the different ingredients, let's say. Now let's look at some recipes. How can we string these things together to solve problems in our companies, in our organizations? And I've got here five. And that's you know, barely scratching the surface. There's lots more that we could have done. But we'll start off kind of simple and we'll work our way up. So obviously one of the core use cases here is around auto-documenting your Power BI semantic models. So let's look at what that might look like. So here we can, and for each one, each of these use cases, I'm basically going to show you how you can string together these different things into some sort of coherent strategy, specific functions that you can call and how you can combine them to do cool stuff. So if you want to document your Power BI semantic models, what we can do is obviously the starting point is having a semantic model in your Power BI workspace, in a workspace. We can call all of these kind of list type stuff on it. So get the data sets. Obviously the data set will, um, if there's more than one data set in your workspace. Get the measures, get the relationships, get the tables. We can also do get Timsel. And we can also do this kind of, uh, we can also call DMV, dynamic management views, to get more properties of things like measures um, and relationships as well. So it's not just the kind of core stuff that we can get. And this is an example from fabric.guru, Sandeep Pawar. And here he's getting more information about the measures in uh, this specific Power BI semantic model. So this is interesting. And then what we can do is write all of these things into a lake house somewhere. I've called it like an admin lake house. We're basically uh, creating tables for each of these. So you might have a data sets table, a measures table, a relationships table, a tables table. And then you can create a Power BI report that basically visualizes all of this data in your Lakehouse tables. And you can expose this to people in your business. So maybe you've got a team of Power BI developers or business analysts that want to know what is in all of our Power BI models, right? What are the measures? What are the tables? How are they all connected? which generally is quite a tedious task to write all these things down. So now you can do that fairly easily with semantic link. So that's the first use case there, right? The second one is around data validation, right? So previously what goes on in Power BI is a bit of a black box. We don't normally see anything come out of the back of it or we can't validate very easily what comes out the back of it. So I've got a few different examples here. And this one, we're going to start with relationship violations, OK? And this is something that we mentioned earlier, but it's just to kind of flesh out this example in a bit more detail. And with relationship violations, what we're talking about is, are there any gaps in my dimension tables? So we used the country example earlier. And one way that you can kind of build this into a bit of a workflow would be, again, you're starting with a Power BI model. In your fabric notebook, you're going to do, you're going to list your tables and your relationships. Then you're going to look at your relationship violations. And then what you might want to do is, if that exists, 
either if you're running this notebook in a data pipeline, then you can call a failure event and log it in your monitoring hub. And then you can take some action there. Or maybe you have a Power BI visualization with relationship violations, monitoring relationship violations. And you can use the new data activator to get an alert, right? So if there's suddenly a new relationship violation, let's say this, this pipeline here runs every time our data set refreshes. So every time your data set refreshes, you're validating what's in it and the relationships in it. And then you might get a, a data activator alert if there are problems on either side of these relationships that you've defined. Yeah, so the second one here is the dependency violation. So this is checking data quality between columns in the same table, right? So I think previously I used the example of state codes and states. Are they consistent for every kind of value in those two columns in a specific table? So again, what you could do is run a fabric notebook that checks for these dependency violations, maybe plots them, and then you take some sort of action. Maybe you drop them from your data set if that's a particularly important relationship that you need to keep consistent. Now, dropping your dependency violations might not be the best way of doing it, but it is one option. So next, we're going to look at measure and model validation with great expectations. So I did a full video on great expectations before, but for those that haven't seen that, great expectations is one of the most used Python libraries for data validation. And they have actually created a connection or an integration with Fabric. So that's quite recently, not even sure if it's been announced yet. But if you go on the website or at least the GitHub code base, you can see that they have been merging in some new Fabric features. And so what you can do now is register data assets from Microsoft Fabric and from Semantic Link specifically. So the previous workflow that I showed you before was something more like this one at the top, right? So they have an existing Spark connector. So you can register Spark data frames as data assets and then perform data validation on those assets. Now what they've added is these three new uh, ways of registering data assets. So you can add a Power BI data table, Power BI table asset, a Power BI measure asset, and a Power BI DAX asset. And we're going to get those using these functions from Semantic Link, right? So read table, evaluate measure, evaluate DAX. Then what we can do is define as you would Normally, in Great Expectations, define an expectation suite, which is basically just a group of expectations. And an expectation is specific things we want to check within our tables, right? So obviously, the Power BI table asset and the Power BI measure asset and the Power BI DAX asset, these all actually output a fabric data frame, right? At the end of the day, they all output a fabric data frame. And a fabric data frame is basically a pandas data frame. And a pandas data frame already had great expectations uh, integration. So you could already do pandas data frame uh, validation. So it wasn't much of a step for them to add in specific connectors for fabric, which is what they've done. So what we can do here is define expectations. This is where all the kind of the logic comes in. So if you're doing um, year on year stuff, maybe doing a measure for year on year revenue change, and you might have some test data and you can validate that. Okay, in this year, in the test data, it should be this, in this, or it should always be blah, 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 whatever your expectation is. I don't know what specific expectation might be for that kind of measure. But you can start to build these expectation suites and then run them as you would create something called a checkpoint and then run it. So this is what this would look like here in a bit more detail. You can kind of 
import great expectations as GX, set your context, add in different data assets here. And these are the new data assets that we've got. And the part that I didn't mention is that your data source will be add fabric Power BI. So that's the integration that we've got with great expectations. So this is what your workflow is going to look like if you want to begin to validate uh, model, Power BI model outputs and measures. So that is data validation. We do have a little bit more on validation. I just wanted to show you this use case. So this use case is more about validating entire models, right? So there's a concept in data engineering that all the cool kids are talking about, and I think it was created by Netflix. It's kind of like a best practice approach to data engineering. And it's called write, audit, publish, meaning that first you write your changes into some not production environment, a kind of audit environment, where you can check. Um, it was actually built for data quality, right? So you publish a data set maybe to a gold layer or a, a silver layer, you would validate it, audit it. And then when it's ready and it's been validated, you publish it into some other place that is production ready that you point your analytics to, your BI to, maybe you do some uh, data science on top of it in that location. So what I've done here is I've brought that WAP, Write, Audit, Publish framework to Power BI model development, right? So if we start at the bottom left here, you can think of these as different workspaces probably in Power BI. So you'd be developing in a dev workspace. When your model is ready, then you want to write that into your audit workspace. And this can be done with deployment pipelines or however you want to do that really. And then we can make use of semantic link to extract that stuff out of the model. We can do list tables, read tables, evaluate measures, similarly to how we did with the great expectations. You can run different validations against uh, all of these tables. And then depending on the results of that validation test, either we can fail it and say, no, it doesn't meet the quality standard. There's these problems with it, in which case you might send it back to the development environment. Or if it's successful, if it passes all of our validation tests, only then we can push it into this kind of published workspace. And that's where your users will gain first sight of it, right? So all of your business users are then gonna be very happy because they're not gonna see all of your mistakes, hopefully. You're not gonna see dashboards that show incorrect data or relationships that aren't working properly. And therefore they're gonna be very happy. So that is the WAP, the Write Audit Publish Framework applied to Power BI model deployment. Okay, so that is some of the strategies and recipes. We've got a few more here. So let's go to this one first, data science workflow. So how could a data science workflow look like in this semantic link paradigm? Well, let's start off by just looking at the, what I would call like the offline scenario. And I'll talk you through what I mean by that in a minute. So say we've got some sort of layering system, progressively uh, more and more refined data. We've got a Power BI model. So maybe you've already got a kind of uh, legacy Power BI model that's got a lot of hours been put into it. And you want to now perform some machine learning on that data set, right? You've got a data scientist ready to go. And you've also got a Power BI data set it's quite complex, lots of relationships, lots of tables, all intricately weaved together. And your data scientist thinks, okay, well, I just want to build or at least analyze that data in a fabric notebook so they can do that. So they're going to start in this kind of offline research phase this is normally what you do as a data scientist. You start doing some exploratory data analysis, having a look at all of these data sets. And now semantic link makes it really easy for you to do that. And all of your tables are semantically aware as well. So you can basically create tables and then analyze them on the fly very quickly. And you can use tools that you're familiar with as a data scientist. So if you're using R, it might be ggplot, 
might be matplotlib if you're a Python user or Seaborn or any sort of data visualization languages or libraries that exist in the Python ecosystem. Then you might do some hypothesis generation based on what you see in the data. And this might go round and round and round for a bit. Finally, you might train a model. And again, this is kind of like a one-off thing, an online, offline prep is what I call it. Train the model, select, optimize the model, and then we're gonna save the model, right? So we've got a saved model and some weights. And then the online scenario, this is what we're gonna be running, I don't know, every day, every hour, depending on your frequency. And this is where we're gonna do model inference, basically. So we've got a trained model. We want to get some predictions based on new data. Maybe every day you want to predict churn for all these new customers that have just joined on your platform in the last few hours, or they've done some actions on the platform in the last few hours. Then this is the kind of the online scenario. Again, you can use semantic link to get your the features in the same uh, structure as you had for the training data set perform your inference, write your predictions back to the lake house. And you might want to integrate that back into a Power BI report. Maybe you want to show uh, probability that this customer will churn in the next three months because that's what your model is predicting. So that might be a valuable insight to show to stakeholders in your business. And that is how you would do that in using Semantic Link in Power BI and Fabric. So the final kind of recipe or strategy that I've kind of thought of here for deploying semantic link in your organization is a little bit out there. I'll give you that. But it's this concept, what I'm going to call data or test driven DAX development. So if you have been exposed to software engineering before, there's this concept called test driven development. And in test driven development, you first write out some tests that your code should pass after you've written your feature. Let's say you're creating a function to add up two numbers. You would say, oh, in this instance, this must equal this. And then you write your function and then you make sure that your function passes based on the test that you've set, right? So this doesn't really exist in Power BI development or at least DAX development. So this idea is what I had for potentially adopting these sort of principles to DAX development. I'm not entirely sure if this will work, but it's just an idea at the moment. So along the top here, you've got this kind of traditional method for Power BI development. And you, know, you kind of start off getting data from different places. And I'm assuming here that we're talking only about the part in the development, Power BI development lifecycle from when you open up Power BI desktop. So we're not talking about anything to do with user stories, user journeys, design, wireframing, none of that. Only talking about the Power BI desktop development process. So you get some data in, you might power query it a bit, you load it into your Power BI model, you create some relationships. And then along the top, your traditional option is to write some DAX in Power BI desktop. Then you might check it if you're feeling up to the task of checking your DAX and running a few um, spot checks on your data and then you might publish it, right? So in this kind of option two, this test-driven DAX development process, what I'm doing is at this stage, before we've written any DAX, I'm going to publish a base model into my dev workspace, right? So we've got our data tables, we've got our relationships defined because we can kind of work those out, but we haven't written any DAX yet. So what you could do is, again, I'm kind of using great expectations here, but you could use any sort of data validation, or you could even potentially use things like PyTest, or there's a whole ecosystem of testing libraries for Python code. So what this is gonna look like is for each DAX measure that you've got to create in your notebook, first you're gonna register a DAX asset using great expectations. You're going to define a set of expectations that that measure must meet, right? So again, that's going to be highly dependent on the measure that you're writing. But you might want to create four or five expectations to say, okay, given this number here, I would expect this to happen. 
then what we can do is use evaluate DAX to write the DAX expression and we can assign it to this DAX asset that we've created. And then we can validate it against that, the expectations, right? So we're going to go into a bit of a loop here. And if it fails, then we're going to do it again. Maybe this fail arrow doesn't go back to there, but it probably goes back more to, probably more going to be like that. You're going to rewrite your DAX, validate it, rewrite it, validate it, rewrite it. And what I've done here is what's quite interesting is that now that we can integrate OpenAI and ChatGPT into our notebooks, I can see a future whereby you give ChatGPT your list of expectations for your measure and a description about what you want it to do. And it's going to give you back the DAX expression, right? And once you have that DAX expression written for you and it passes all of your validation tests, then we can add those measures to our model, hook them up to our Power BI visualizations and go about our merry way. I think in the future we'll see a lot more of this type of thing pairing great expectations or at least some sort of validation library with ChatGPT for code generation. It's such a good pairing because you know we can't trust the output of ChatGPT on its own. But if you're going in a cycle of validation of the output with generation, validation, generation, validation, generation, until all of your tests are met, all of these great all of the expectations have successfully been passed, then you know that the code, if you define good expectations, you know that that DAX expression is meeting your needs. Obviously, it falls down to your ability to write good validation tests. So then that is test-driven DAX development. So those are five recipes that you can use to apply Semantic Link to different business use cases in your organization. Next, what I want to highlight is some things to be aware of before you go charging out and applying all of these use cases in your organization. There's a few things that you need to bear in mind. Okay, so let's start off digging into some of these things to bear in mind when we're implementing Semantic Link. So let's start off with the first one that I'm calling a medallion architecture. So something that you have to bear in mind is that I would argue that semantic link can encourage potentially bad practice depending on your data strategy in your organization. So it's something we need to adopt very carefully. And this is what I mean by this. If we think about what a concept that I call minimum viable DAX, right? DAX is right at the end of your data pipeline and what I try and teach or I try and implement with clients is to get as much of that logic out of DAX and into your database, your lake house architecture, because then that logic can be reused by other people and it's written normally in SQL, which is much nicer than DAX. Lots of people know Lots more people know SQL in this world than they know DAX. But I do recognize that you're always going to need some DAX if you're using Power BI, right? All of the kind of filtering logic, all of that kind of stuff. There's lots of DAX stuff that's very difficult to, well, it's impossible. You can't extract all of the logic and bring it all into the, the gold, silver, bronze layers. But you should be trying to move as much as possible. And by using Semantic Link, it kind of encourages people to not do that. So Semantic Link allows you to access all of that complicated logic included in Power BI files, which might encourage people to keep on using these big bulky Power BI files with lots of horrible DAX. So let's just think about that in an example. So if I am a Power BI developer here and I need a year to date revenue for a chart, right? I've got a new chart that I'm creating. Oh, I'll just create a measure for that. Then other people can use Semantic Link to get that data. So they create their year to date revenue DAX measure in their Power BI model. And then if other people need to use that year to date revenue, either they have to, in the best case scenario, you recreate or copy the year to date code into their new Power BI semantic model, or they're going to be using semantic link to get the year to date revenue output numbers, and then somehow integrate that back into their lake house. And that to me does get me a little bit scared that what a better way of doing it is recognizing that 
things like year to date, time intelligence calculations, they don't need to be done in DAX, especially now that we have Fabric. You know, there's a whole raft of options available to you using industry chat standard tools for time intelligence calculations. Bringing that logic into your data warehouse is a much better way of working so that when other people need to use that year to date revenue calculation, then they can just query potentially a SQL view or a SQL table, depending on the size of that view. If it's going to be a long running view, if there's lots of logic in there, you might want to materialize it as a table so that when the next person comes along and builds a dashboard that uses year to date revenue, they're going to be using exactly the same numbers as you. And you're not going to be doing this loop the loop from through a Power BI data set. It doesn't sit very nicely with me. Similarly, I have a similar worry about machine learning, right? Now, my view is that a machine learning feature engineering pipeline should not really go through a Power BI data set in the best case scenario. Now, if you've got a very, very mature Power BI, I say mature, I mean very, very complex Power BI data model that's taken you years to build and you've got one for your whole company, then maybe there is a case for using Semantic Link to build features for machine learning. But, and in that case, you'd have your bronze, silver, gold, build the Power BI data set, perform some sort of ML, and then write your predictions back to either a silver or gold layer. And there's just something that doesn't sit quite right with me. Just because you can do this, I don't think it's necessarily the best data strategy for an organization. Most features you can easily recreate in a silver or gold layer, right, for machine learning. Now, I don't think it takes too long to recreate the logic in a Power BI model, personally. And I would rather have that in your silver and gold layer before it ever gets to Power BI, personally. This kind of architecture along the bottom, you've got your bronze, silver, gold. You're performing your machine learning, you're training your data sets on that warehouse data, right? Not on your Power BI data set. And you might have to do some sort of transformations here to get the data in the same kind of space. But I don't think it'd be too onerous, to be honest. And this for me is a much better architecture for machine learning. And then you can visualize your predictions or whatever you want in a Power BI data set at the end, if that's your goal. So I would be careful about doing this sort of thing with your data using Power BI measures for training machine learning models. The other reason why that that might be important is because of limits. Now, typically machine learning models use a lot of data. Um, and I did read somewhere that there's a limit on the number of rows that you can extract from your Power BI data set into a Fabric data frame. Now I heard that was 100,000. Probably need to confirm that with the product team. But I did a little bit, little bit of a test and I had a data frame of 187,000. I had a Power BI data set table with 187,000 rows. And for me, it worked fine. So it's definitely more than 100,000. It might be, I haven't actually found the limit yet, but it is something to bear in mind. If you're doing machine learning, especially if you're doing deep learning, any sort of things in that kind of realm, you're probably gonna be wanting more than a few hundred thousand rows for most models that you choose. So that is a potentially weak point in Semantic Link that you need to be aware of, right? In that case, then you definitely wanna be doing this kind of thing training your model off full data sets without these constraints for the number of rows. And you can do some stuff with like looping through. I haven't actually tried this, you know, kind of like paginating that data frame. But yeah, again, that makes me feel a bit uneasy. So these are some of the things that you need to bear in mind. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, these are complete showstoppers, not at all. And there is lots of use cases that we've seen that don't touch on any of this. But these are three things that I've picked up just from using it and thinking about it a bit more deeply. Just because you know it's available to us to extract data from a Power BI model, it doesn't mean necessarily that we want to re-architect our entire organization and forget all of the principles that we've been working to previously just because something is now a possibility. So let's move on to the final thoughts. So just to wrap up everything that we've learned in the last 45 minutes or so, hope you found this useful. I'm just gonna leave with some clarifying final thoughts. So I think this is fairly obvious, this one. 
Semantic Link opens the door to many new workflows that were previously not possible. To me, Power BI datasets were kind of like under lock and key. Once they were created, you can't do anything with them. And so now that's been completely blown away and specifically opened up to the world of Python. So probably the most interesting use cases, for me at least, are around validating what's going on in our Power BI models, right? And in our measures. Because you know, people who create measures, you might want to validate that those measures are accurate and they're doing what you want them to be doing. And not just when you create them, but every time your data press runs, you might want to check that your measures are being calculated correctly. Because sometimes you might have new keys that throw things off, or you might have um, erroneous data that messes up a calculation that you haven't accounted for. And so being able to constantly validate the data and the measures that you create is going to be very powerful. So with great power comes great responsibility. Now we hear this with lots of technology and I kind of alluded to it earlier, uh, just because we have this power doesn't mean that we should be wielding it willy nilly you know, any way we see fit. We need to be quite careful in how we architect a solution around semantic link. It opens up a lot of possibilities, but it also opens up lots of potential avenues for things to go wrong in your organization. So you do need to be careful about that. And for me, it always comes back uh, as a data strategist, it always comes back to the data strategy, right? You need to start with the data strategy of what you're trying to achieve in your organization. And you need to think carefully about, does Semantic Link help me achieve what I want to achieve in my data strategy better than what we're doing with our existing solution, right? Now, each use case will be different for Semantic Link. As I mentioned, for me, the ones I'm most excited, excited around are the data validation ones, the more data science machine learning stuff. Personally, I don't think I'll be using uh, in the short term, at least, for all the reasons that I've mentioned. But each use case for, will be different depending on what you do in your organization. So have a play around investigate for yourselves and come to your own decisions about whether semantic link or each use case is better to use semantic link or to use other methods. So there we have it. That was the first ever feature 360, the first in a new series where I'm going to be doing deep dive 360 analysis of new features in Microsoft Fabric. Let me know in the comments if you found this useful to really go deep on one specific feature and leave a comment below for what you want me to cover next. Thanks very much for watching. I will see you in the next video.